How does the size and scope of government that we have today compare to that which the founders advocated? Obviously, the uh, you know the founders had a range within which they were comfortable. Jefferson and Madison on the one hand, and people like Alexander Hamilton on the other um, disagreed to a certain degree about you know how big the federal government should be, what the national government should do. Jefferson and Madison tended to read the Constitution as, as sort of a restraining order. It, it delegated specific powers to the national government, um, things that the national government was you know clearly allowed to do, um, but all the things that were left out, those things remained in the hands of uh, individuals or the state governments. You know, Hamilton um, was kind of the originator of the living constitution. He thought that you could read between the lines, um, get a sense of the, the, the spirit of the, of the document, and he used the necessary and proper clause, for example, to, to justify doing things like create a national bank, which, um, which wasn't obviously in the text of the constitution. Um, but I think even Hamilton today would say that the government has grown to a size and a scope that's well beyond what he ever envisioned or he ever called for. Um, you know, people could argue, and I think there's, there's a point to be made, that, that the world is a much more complex place today. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that government deliberates on that, that didn't even exist back in the 18th century. But um, maybe the question for an economist or a political scientist rather than a historian is whether or not that complexity means that we want more centralization, more centralized decision making, or whether in fact that, that complexity means that it's best for individuals to be able to, to make their own decisions um, for their own lives because you know, presumably they know best what they want. What can you tell us about the mindset that existed in the average colonist in the mid-1800s? If you look at the letters that, that people wrote back in the 1740s or the 1750s, um, if pressed to identify themselves, they would call themselves Virginians or New Yorkers or Carolinians. Um, very few people would have used the term American. You know, they might say British if they were speaking about international affairs. Um, but the colonies had all been established for, for different reasons, by different groups of people um, from different parts of England. Um, some were clearly uh, about making money. Um, some were clearly about creating a, 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 a godly place on earth um, that would inspire others, um, like the Puritans in, in, in New England. Um, Americans came here for different reasons. They came here for different purposes. They evolved uh, into different societies. And I think that was especially the case um, during this period of benign neglect. Um, when you look at the late 17th century, um, when you follow through into the mid um, 18th century, the British government was pretty preoccupied and it didn't really uh, rule the colonies with, with a firm hand. They were pretty autonomous. Um, and they grew used to that. They were happy with that. They had their own parliaments, their own legislatures, their own colonial assemblies. Um, they taxed themselves. They made their own laws. Certainly they existed within this, this British metropolitan network. They were subject to British trade policy and external uh, controls like that. But, but they had a tremendous degree of self-government, and they didn't want to give that up. Um, in 1754, Ben Franklin was among those who, who proposed up in Albany this plan of union that would form a very loose confederation um, of the colonies and better allow them to um, defend British interests in North America vis-a-vis -vis the French and the Indians, um, and also presumably negotiate treaties of trade uh, with the Indians to speak with one voice. Um, but while Franklin thought that was a fantastic idea, when the idea went back to the colonial legislatures, people laughed. They really didn't want um, to have anything to do with the other colonies. Quakers from Pennsylvania didn't want to be governed by cavaliers from Virginia, for example. And certainly uh, the, the opposite was true. So the interesting thing is that what really unites Americans after the French and Indian War when the British start restricting their ability to, to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains, when the British begin to uh, impose taxes upon them without their consent, um, when at the Boston Massacre it at least appears to Americans that the British are not only taking their liberty and not only taking their property, but also taking their lives, um, what unites them is the ability to be left alone. Um, they want the British to leave them alone. They don't want to be governed by this far-off, powerful central government um, in this distant capital. And so um, that's an interesting and maybe peculiarly American kind of unity, um, the belief that we come together so that we could all mind our own business.